water for a minute or two, I came up with this. I don't think that one could exist without the other. Thankfully, that seemed to satisfy him. <laughs> and thinking I had done a pretty good job of dodging the bullet, I packed that topic away in my brain for a few years. As my relationship with Unitarian Universalism deepened, I found myself developing a philosophy on music ministry, something I never thought I would even begin to contemplate, and doing more serious, deliberate work with, relation, with music in relation to worship. Who knew? Every year, our youth stand on the chancel in front of their congregations, reading the faith statements they painstakingly prepared to conclude their journey in the coming-of-age program. It makes me remember when I wrote one as a coming-of-ager. Back then, we called it affirmation. And I remember the gist of mine being, I don't know what I believe at this moment, and that's okay. Groundbreaking. <laughs> and so typical of a free-thinking 13-year-old UU kid. When I look back at that statement and at my interview here with Charlie, I think what I really meant was that I was a little scared of thinking too deeply about it. But growing up gives us clarity and courage, and now I have thought pretty deeply about it. And fortunately for me, today I have a platform for delving deeper into what I put my faith in and captive audience. <laughs> My first job out of college was working in the corporate office as well as teaching a, a program called Music Together. Some of you may have taken Music Together classes with your children, and some of you in this room were even in my classes here in Montclair. It's a research-based early, early childhood music program. The main philosophical ideas behind the curriculum are that one, all children are musical, and two, all people can learn to sing in tune and keep a steady beat. To a passerby, when I was teaching those classes, it would look like I was just sitting on the floor acting like a crazy person, singing a bunch of nonsense and making animal sounds, but there was so much more to it than just the wheels on the bus. Getting a group of adults who have never met each other before, and most of whom don't consider themselves musical at all, to sing in three-part harmony? What a rush. I'd gone to college and become this classically trained musician who thought only the talented could make music, and here I was telling parents that anyone can and everyone should make music. And it wasn't because music would make your child smarter or because it helps their language, social, emotional, cognitive, and physical development, although all of those things are true. The reason everyone should make music is because it feels good and it makes the world a better place. Isn't that enough? Just in case that's not enough for you, I will tell you that a ton of studies have been done on how music affects our brains. One of my favorites tells us that when we're actively making music with other people, I'm talking about making music with our own bodies, not just listening to it, the level of the hormone oxytocin goes sky high. Now, oxytocin is a powerful hormone and neurotransmitter that's associated with empathy and trust and relationship, relationship building and certain adult activities. <laughs> because of this, and the times that we see it rise, it's also called the love hormone often. So, I'm here to tell you, singing feels good. Because science. <laughs> <laughs> if that's true, then why don't we do it more often? We used to. Families and friends would get together on a Friday night and gather around the piano and sing for fun. We've become a culture of music consumers rather than music makers. Teaching music together changed my perspective on music completely. I always thought I was born to perform, and now I was realizing that I and everyone else were born music makers. And yeah, I still love to perform. <laughs> I mentioned my grandmother earlier, Nanny Rita. Those nights when she'd come to babysit were my absolute favorite because we would just sing and sing and sing. Our repertoire was not extensive, but it was classy. Chloe's Song of the Swamp, Sam Made the Pants Too Long, The Dark Town Strutter's Ball. Of course, I had no idea that the word dark town was a word that Nanny Rita probably shouldn't have taught her three-year-old grandchild, but oh well. One day, my father came home with an old baby grand piano from a 
yard sale up the street. It had been sitting for years, unplayed and terribly out of tune. And I mean really out of tune. You play one key and you get two or three different pitches. <laughs> Nanny Rita came to babysit that night, and we sang our songs on that out of tune piano anyway. We didn't hear the out of tune piano. All we heard was the music. And after bedtime, when I should have been sleeping, I sat by my bedroom door and listened to her play that out of tune piano all night long. She didn't care what it sounded like, she just loved playing it. And I didn't care what it sounded like. I just loved listening. Nanny Rita made me sing those same songs she taught me as a three-year-old at every single family gathering. It wasn't a question of whether Stearns would sing for us, it was just a question of when. And of course, I grumbled like teenagers are supposed to do, and if you asked me at the time, I would have flatly denied this, but I loved it. Because no one played the piano like her. Then, in July of 2013, Anne Marie died. At the time, I was teaching music together in, of all places, Honolulu, Hawaii. I was 5,000 miles away and six hours behind my family. It was the deepest and most profound loss I had ever experienced. And I had never felt so utterly isolated and alone. I didn't know what to do with myself. I felt like there was nothing I could do. Nothing to grasp onto that was stable. And then this song popped into my head, written by Carol Hall and Stephen Lutback. And if I believed in heaven, I believe that now you're singing in the choir. And if I believed in angels, I'd imagine you in white and quite the flyer. And if I believed in reasons, then I wouldn't ask why dying seems so wrong. But I just believe in music, so I guess that I'll imagine you a song. So I stood on the beach, and I sang. I sang that song in its entirety, and I sang Chloe's song at the swamp, and Sammy made the pants too long, and the dark town strutters ball, and five foot two eyes of blue. And I realized then that the stable, constant thing I was wanting to grab onto was right there with me. Music. I didn't have to summon it, or use any special skills, or make it into anything specific. It just was. Music. Just. And music always has been. It was present when I listened to Nanny Rita play that out-of-tune piano, and when I put the karaoke speakers out my bedroom window, and when I was bullied in middle school, and when I fell in love and got married. It's with me when I wake up in the morning, when I'm eating breakfast, when I'm driving. It is in every corner of every room, filling every nook, every cranny. Music is omnipresent. Don't get me wrong, there are other places and things and people who mean the world to me. I can remember when I first met my husband. I can remember the moment I stepped off the plane for the first time and I went to teach in Hawaii. I remember the first time I saw my favorite movie, Snoopy Come Home. <laughs> but I can't remember the first time I encountered music, because it has always been there. We put our faith in whatever has proven to always be there for us. For some people, it's the concept of God as it appears in many mainstream religions. For some of you, it might be this place. It might be your spouse or your parent. It might be a pond you went ice skating on as a child. For your four-year-old, it might be a stuffed animal. We put our faith in the things that are constant. <coughs> One of the things I love about a Unitarian Universalist worship service is that there's something for everyone. I don't really like sermons, said the guy giving the sermon. <laughs> a bunch of words all in a row from one person just isn't the way my brain likes to receive information. But still, I walk away from the service with something I didn't walk in with because my point of entry, my on-ramp, is the music. Everybody has a different way in. Maybe the chalice lighting is special for you, or the 
prayer or even the offering. For me, and I suspect that for more than one of you, it's the music. Sometimes people tell me that the music adds so much to a Sunday morning, and to those people I say, no, it doesn't. The music is part of our being together on Sunday morning. A friend of mine who was a Juilliard-educated, world-class musician once told me that, music, that making music was as close as she gets to praying. She said it like it was an excuse, like it would somehow be better if she could find herself praying in a conventional way. I wish that she had had the courage to say it differently, to say, music is prayer for me, or music is my spirituality, or music is what makes me see the holy. What makes you see the holy? I challenge you this morning to give yourself permission to identify what that is for you. What's always there? What's omnipresent? What is your constant? And then, resist the urge to make an excuse for it. Whatever it is, it is integral to your being, and it is one of the things that gives you your inherent worth and dignity. I'd like to leave you with a little game of Mad Libs. I'm going to take a well-known, often-quoted passage from the Bible, and I never thought I'd be in a pulpit quoting the Bible. <laughs> I'm going to replace the word love with music. Music is patient. Music is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Music does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Music never fails. May it be so.